Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to Room for Discussion. My name is Joshua Noy. I'm 21 years old. Um, my hobbies are boxing, uh, running, being generally outside. I study environmental sciences and I live in Amsterdam. Uh, last week I went to Athens and I just came back on Saturday. Uh, this might all just seem like random information that I'm giving you right now, uh, which it is. But this is exactly the kind of information that companies use and gather to predict their behavior. Um, this is all part of privacy. We all seem to value our privacy a lot, hence the, the, the rage on the, on the current privacy scandals and the outcry for better privacy regulations such as GDPR. But what exactly is privacy? And why is it important and m maybe even a necessary value in our current society? What is exactly so bad about a society that's completely transparent? The, di the dictionary definition of privacy is the right to be let alone and the right to make our own decisions. But why? Why do we, why do we also want that? What, what's so important about, about being left alone? To answer this question, uh, today we have Annika Sponsley and Elsa Buster with us. Uh, Annika Sponsley is the partner at Deloitte Risk Advisory and a GDPR expert at Northwestern Europe. And she heads the privacy department at Deloitte Risk Advisory. Elsa Buster is an assistant professor at uh, Leiden University and she is part of panels that inform governments on privacy regulations and how to maintain the privacy <laughs> lawfully. So um, the question that we pose today is whether privacy is actually necessary or whether it's just nostalgic sentiment. So for this, give a warm welcome to Annika Sponsole and Elsa Busser. All right, well, welcome here uh, at the UFA. Thank um, you. Madam Sponsole, we uh, just heard you, you are a GDPR expert, among other things. Do you often talk to students about privacy matters? Uh, yes, I do. I have a lot of um, students in my team, work students, uh, but not in this setting. So I'm really <laughs> pleased to be here, actually. All right, cool. All right, Ms. Buster, as an assistant professor at the University of Leida, I assume you speak to students about these kind of matters a lot more often. <laughs> uh, how do you feel about talking to the students in this kind of setting? Well, I'm happy to be here, and thank you for inviting me, uh, by the way. I think privacy is something that should keep all of us busy in our heads, and it's something that affects all of us. So I'm quite happy to speak for a different audience today. Yeah, nice. All right, so we're going to talk a lot about uh, many different aspects of privacy, but the first thing that we want to do is um, kind of understand how much of our personal information is available online. And uh, we always try to get to know our guests a little bit beforehand. Mm -hmm. So we thought, why not get to know our guests based on what we can find about them online? Uh, Madame de Busser, what do you think we found about you? I mm -hmm. think you probably found my biggest hobby. Um, I'm not keeping that a secret because it's on my LinkedIn profile. Yes, it is running, I think. Yes, yes. it is. <laughs> uh, you also ran the New York Marathon on the 3rd of November, 2014. Perfect. Very <laughs> impressive. Do you know what your time was? My time for running in... Yeah, how, how long which it year? took you? 2014. 2014, I think that was 4 hours 16. No, wow. I'm sorry. No, it's, it was a bit longer. <laughs> four hours. <laughs> the other one. Sorry. No, that no, was 2013. <laughs> All right. No, yeah. it's still very impressive. It was four hours, 22 minutes and 37 right. seconds. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Correct. Well, that <laughs> these kind of uh, things are online is not that, that much of a problem, of course. Because it's something to be proud of, actually. What's, what's more worrisome or more, more, more shocking to us, at least, is that we could find your personal, personal phone numbers and personal email addresses within five minutes of looking. And even all the ministers of the Netherlands at the, uh, in the same manner. But I Ms. put my, my telephone number uh, deliberately online. Okay. Yeah. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Sponsole, do you know how that is possible, to, that we could find that much information on so many people so easily? Um, first of all, it depends on what you put yourself online yeah. and in what kind of like framing around it. So my phone number, I put it online so that I was always, that, that clients and um, relationships are always able to call me. It's my business number. Uh, but I'm really conscious of what I put online myself. Um, I do see that there are a lot of pictures and that kind of things. Um, and if I don't like that, then I ask whether that could be deleted. Um, but how is it possible? Because a lot of people put a lot of things online, on Facebook, on social media, and they don't see the, 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 the chain it has or the sequence it has when you put something online. Yeah, um, yeah. And, as and a others a will use uh, it. 
despite the fact that you don't know that. By the way, that's not allowed, but it happens. Yeah. yeah. And and on a personal level, not necessarily as a privacy expert, how do you feel about that much information being online of, of so many people, from even ministers of the of the Dutch government? Um, I think more and more that uh, people should be aware of the f the consequences if you put something online. So I think it has a lot of impact. Um, if you put certain pictures of parties uh, like uh, 10 years ago, it will impact perhaps when you apply for a new employer. So I think you should really take into account if you put something online, what the, what the impact will be in the future. Yeah. Also parents, if they do that for kids. Mm -hmm. um, so take a certain responsibility and be aware of the impact it yeah. has. So there's, so there's a level of individual responsibility that, that, that applies to all of us on the amount of information we put online. But apart from that, um, companies like Google, um, they, they claim that they know who you are, right? That's uh, based on, on, on the things that we do online. And I've looked at what, who Google thinks I am, and I am profiled as a 24-year-old male who likes politics, jazz music, coffee, and restaurants, which is really accurate, except for the fact that I'm not a man but a woman. Um, but Madame de Busser, how, how is it possible that they, that they know me so well? This is actually based on your clicking behavior. So things you've liked on Facebook, things that you've clicked on, websites that you've clicked on, um, which enables Google to build a profile on you. And like you see, it's not always accurate. It is also based on algorithms, not necessarily a human, but an algorithm that is a formula that puts things together, puts yeah. pieces of the puzzle together. For example, if I click on a lot of running websites, it will be obvious that running is in my profile yeah. uh, of Google. Uh, if you click on a lot of jazz uh, music, or if you have a lot of music uh, related to jazz in, 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 in iTunes, for example, that will be in your profile. Yeah. But you see that it's not always accurate, and that's also one of the risks, <laughs> the inaccuracy of these kinds of profiles. Because based on these profiles, you will receive personalized advertising. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And but ap apart from from clicking, there's also something with trackers, right, uh, Madam Sponsley, that they put on websites to kind of like see where I'm going. Yeah, so that they can follow you over yeah. websites. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, but that's of course also banned due to cookie legislation, but it's still there. Yeah. 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 And how does that work? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not in the technical, but yeah, they yeah. just they can follow you over the website, but don't ask me the technical. I'm the, the legal person <laughs> here. <laughs> the legal person. They th but basically, they, they, they follow us around. Yeah. They see where, where we're going. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, well, let's do a little sample test with the audience among us, because privacy is such a, such a, such a societal, societal thing. Um, and we can see how much a privacy awareness is among the sample that we have right here. Uh, raise your hand if, if this statement applies to you. Who is generally concerned of how much private uh, of how much private information is up for grabs on the internet. <laughs> All right. Quite a lot, you know. Quite a lot, yeah. <laughs> Who knows which privacy settings they have on Facebook? <laughs> a lot less. <laughs> Who accepts cookies without reading them? <laughs> Basically everyone. And who registers for websites by using Facebook? Yeah, all yeah. right, that's not... Quite a lot as well. Yeah. Um, well, that's interesting. A lot of people say that they're very uh, conscious about their privacy and they really worry about privacy. But our behavior seems to be very different as a scene in this little sample and it's consistent in a research that's done that says 90% of the people have this discrepancy. Mr. Buster, why do you think this discrepancy exists? I think it's because we often um, exchange convenience for privacy or exchange privacy for convenience, I should say. You download an app and you download an app for convenience. You download an app, for example, of the Dutch railway system because you want to know when your train is delayed. But before you can download the app, you need to give access to a certain amount of data. And so if you don't want to give that access, you cannot download the app. So you're you have the choice between convenience and privacy, or I should say data protection, but I think we will talk about the difference between privacy and data protection in a minute. Um, so it's a choice you make, but is it really a choice? You could ask yourself, is this really a free choice? If yep. you choose privacy or data protection, you cannot use the product. Yeah. So that's a question we should all ask ourselves. I think the responsibility goes at the end of the day to the companies behind mm -hmm. it. So I think it's the company that should say, okay, for me it's important that I have 
that I use the personal data in an ethical and responsible way. Yeah. Um, I see it as a way to come closer to my customers, to my patients, to my mm -hmm. citizens, to become more intimate. Um, but if I do so, I want to do it at the right way. So I want to reduce the, the enormous uh, lengthy privacy statements. Yeah. I want to be very open, very transparent. And I think that's a trend which we're currently into. Yeah, yeah, but unfortunately, not all companies uh, uh, do that. So, so what you're saying is that there's a, a too large dependence on these apps, on these websites, that therefore we don't actually have a free choice to uh, to give up all of that personal information. Although I have to say that I do think something, something is changing, changing and, and that's based, based on, on a few years, years ago, ago whenever, whenever I gave, I gave uh, presentations, presentations on privacy and data, and data protection, protection, my point, my point was, was that data, data protection privacy, privacy should, should become, become a selling, selling point. point. Meaning that, that you, as a consumer, as a consumer would, would choose product, product A over similar product, product B, B because, because product, product A has, has better, better privacy or gives better, better, better data, data protection. protection. Um, um, I, think I think by, by now, now we're, we're getting, getting there, there. Slowly, slowly but surely, but surely and, and that is actually thanks, thanks to a few scandals, scandals that have come out, let's be honest. Uh, that's, because that's because of recent news. I do think that consumers are waking up to it. And, and are, are moving, moving slowly, slowly away, away from, from that, that choice, that, that, that trade-off trade between privacy and, and convenience. And, and that, that should also give a message, message to companies. To companies. Yeah. When, when companies see, see that consumers, that consumers are, are leaving them, them because of, of worse, worse privacy, privacy and data protection, data protection um, as, opposed as opposed to their competitors, their competitors that, that will also give them a really strong message. So that is where the responsibility of the consumer is. <laughs> yeah, um, basically, I think there might be another explanation that we'll explore when we, uh, when after the first audience question, which is the possibility that we actually do not care as much about our privacy and our data protection as we say we do. Uh, but first, there's the option for an audience question about uh, how much information is up for grabs on the internet right now. Does anybody have a question? Yeah, in the front, there's a. <laughs> I have a question about how. Can we be protected against other citizens that uh, make fake uh, websites or a fake Facebook account or an anti-hives and steal your picture and Photoshop it and put another story around it and uh, you have no idea what's happening? Like there is a lot of uh, uh, things going on. Uh, for instance, if a politician or a journalist is saying something and... Uh, uh, uh Websites like Geen Style uh, are already completely jumping on a person and uh, complete with rape fantasies published about a female journalist who had an opinion they didn't ap appreciate. What? How do you protect yourself against other citizens and how can Facebook and Google and, uh, and other account hives be held accountable? Who do you address your question to? Either? Uh, who wants to respond? <laughs> This is a, um, a difficult question, to be honest, because you are um, uh, pointing out to, to several topics, both privacy, data protection, but also um, the freedom of speech, mm -hmm. um, journalism. Um, so I can answer the question from a privacy perspective, and that's when, y when you are careful with your own personal data, that it cannot be used by others. Um, and in certain cases, um, your consent needs to be asked when your personal data is being used. And if that's not the case, um, then you should issue a claim or... Yes, yeah, so, uh, sorry, if I don't, uh, if that's not the right... Uh, the question is, if your neighbor uh, just has, holds a grudge against you and puts a Facebook account of supposedly you, on Facebook, just takes a snapshot and managed to get a snapshot of your uh, kind of, of your identity face fraud and online. Just, yes, identity fraud. Yes. That's what okay. I mean. Yeah. Because you didn't give any consent. You didn't do oh. anything. You they, were they very go consistent. to the police. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, if you know it, but the problem is, <laughs> when will you do you know it? Okay, of course, if you know it, you go to the police. But the proof and the finding out who is doing things like this, for instance, with the journalist of the Volkskrant who was uh, uh, on Geen Style, which is a website, uh, uh, men uh, were writing rape fantasies about her. Well, uh, you go, uh, she can go to the police, but who, how are they going to... Uh, yeah, no, that's, 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 that that's indeed a horrible scenario. Is there even uh, something that, that, that we, we could do about those things, Madame de Wister? I think you're absolutely right that it's very difficult to find out if this is happening about you. Um, but I think we have to look more into defamation and slander um, law 
laws than into privacy laws, because this is where your reputation is, is, is affected. So I think this is more into the crime, uh, the criminal act of slander and defamation than into a violation of privacy, which of course is linked. But I think you have more success to go to the police as reports slander and defamation. Yeah. If you know it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. You, you I know, yeah. But that's, yeah. that's All right. of course, a difficult forum that the internet gives us is that it's difficult to find this yeah. kind of information. Yeah, many benefits, but also. Uh, Many harmful things. Yeah. I think. Yes, but can you hold those accountable? That the websites that that, that, that exploit pay the ones that bring out the website and give the opportunity for these people to do these things. That is Facebook. That is uh, Google. That is uh, all kinds of uh, hives and all other things I do not know about. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, they give the opportunities. So yeah, I think that's that's also the internet is a very beautiful place sometimes for sharing information, but it can also be very harmful, yeah. very harmful yeah. for 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 these uh, for these situations. So th thank you very much for your question. Um, so let's 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 look at um, uh, uh, more of like the principled question of privacy. So we see that many people here say we care about privacy, but um, uh, we do accept indeed convenience uh, over uh, over privacy sometimes. Um, Madam Sponsley, do you think people still care about privacy online? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. And even more and more, um, especially when uh, in a time where also you have more and more data breaches um, and they also see the consequences of data being leaked. Um, so I think um, when the internet started, uh, there was just a lot of uh, unawareness about it. Nobody knew it. And now you see the consequences of it. What will happen? Um, so I think more and more people are going to care about um, uh, uh, privacy and I think that they will also value the companies more or the government um, that cares about it uh, yeah. and make sure that you are not um, uh, being harmed. Yeah, so you're referring maybe also to the Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal of the past uh, few weeks. Um, you, you, you can say that that's uh, a lot of social caused a lot of social outcry. But on the same time, many people said that they would delete their Facebook, but actually came back or deleted it for a few days or never deleted it at all. Um, is that not just also then part of a sort of hype to then be angry at Facebook, but then post uh, anti-Mark Zuckerberg memes on Facebook, right? Isn't it just uh, not something that we really care about, but just something that we do because it's, it's part of the current hype? I think this is where convenience comes in again, because like, you just asked the question, how many people um, have, have registered for other websites through Facebook? You want to log in on Instagram, you, you go through Facebook. Yeah. Or you want to log in into another uh, service, you log in through Facebook. I think a lot of people have had the wish to delete their Facebook account after Cambridge Analytica came out, uh, or after the whole story came out, but didn't because of these reasons. If, if, if you completely delete your Facebook, you're going to maybe lose touch with a few friends. You're going to have to give up on a few services that are linked to Facebook. And so that is the, the difficulty of the whole thing. Doesn't this then kind of uh, show that uh, we, we say we care more about privacy than we actually do? Because we seem to value our convenience more than the privacy, then even though, well, we say we, we value privacy so much that we would delete Facebook over it, at least sponsorly. Yeah, to a certain um, extent. So I think that... Um, um, more and more people are becoming aware of what, again, the impact will be and the consequences will be. So yes, it is convenient to have Facebook, but it's also convenient perhaps to, to um, look very well at your privacy settings um, to make sure that you are more and more in control. And I hope that we go into a trend both with um, uh, the, the current times, but also with the new uh, general data protection regulation where we um, give, where companies give the control more and more back to the people. Yeah. Um, to the citizens, to the um, uh, customers, to the patients, uh, and I and I hope that that um, um, will only um, uh, increase the trend. So, would you say that um, pri th the the current lack of care about privacy is just um, just an issue that has to be solved, basically? I absolutely think so. I think we we do not realize um, what would happen if we don't have any privacy legislation. So. At the moment, we, we already have privacy legislation that will be um, more, s more strengthened because the new GDPR will be coming, and I know that we will be talking about that later on. But I think that um, 
is more and more important that people um, realize that. Well, that may be very interesting because that's, uh, that's then, then my question to you, what would that look like? Like what, what would happen if we wouldn't have privacy regulations online? Um, so for example, um, I think that if we do not have the current uh, privacy legislation, then your uh, employer would already know your shopping behavior at Gal uh, Gal, <laughs> for example, or perhaps even your insurance company. Um, your insurance company would want to have information from your hospital and your hospital would be allowed to give that. So there's currently already so much things in place which avoid that your data is being shared. But the fact that we often um, only look at online privacy, uh, privacy that's why we where everybody said, yeah, if you put it online yourself, uh, privacy is dead. That's often what's being said. But I think we do not realize that um, the current legislation also helps us so much in keeping our own identity and a little bit of our own freedom because it would be horrible. Uh, and it's often also based on assumptions. So for example, if you shop at Albert Heijn and on Friday you always buy, I don't know, 10 boxes of, of wine and uh, a lot of cigarettes and whatever, but you only do that once in a while when a lot of friends are coming, whatever. But if you look at your shopping behavior, behavior then it's horrible. And based on your, and your insurance company might think you will die within a few weeks. Um, it's, it's based on assumptions, uh, but the fact that you cannot share it because that's not allowed between that kind of organizations is the reason why we're already protected. So our problem here is the social checking that might occur when uh, when all the data is online. Would, would you say that, that a, so a, social, a social checking system will, will occur which limits people's autonomy and limits the way people behave? I don't know what you mean with social, how you mean that, because uh, it's, that al it's already there. Yeah, uh, um, well... Um, that you're being judged by, yeah, by, by for example, your insurance company oh or your boss yeah, yeah, or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, but imagine if if it's a, a completely symmetrical lifting of, of of data protection and everybody knows everything about everyone, then I think this way of judging might disappear, and uh, then that would be less of a problem, right, Mr. Busser? I think um, Annika just made a very interesting point that what a lot of consumers, uh, a lot of citizens don't realize is the consequences. What can happen? And that goes back to my, my previous point when I said these scandals, uh, these, these stories coming out, do help waking people up to what could possibly happen. So what is the worst case scenario if I put my data out there? And that I think is also something that companies should be more clear of in their privacy policy. Um, I know that hardly anybody reads these very, very long slabs of text. Um, they can also be very difficult to understand. But if now companies will, would be clearer in what are the possible consequences of us using your data, that would help a lot. Yeah, so, so would you say that what happened with Cambridge Analytica, that that is an example of a worst case scenario? I think so. Um, I think this is a, an example of a worst case scenario. Um, but like you said, it might just now flare up attention and then it will die out um, again. Although this will resonate with people. And probably it will only be a matter of time before something similar will happen with a different company or with a different set of data, and then attention will flare up again. Yeah. And that will also always resonate with, a, with, a, with an amount of people, gradually attention will be higher. Yeah. Awareness will grow, awareness will, will well this increase. This might be a weird question, but um, that ma might also be one of the causes for that attention dies out again. Why was it actually so bad what happened with Cambridge Analytica? Because a lot of data was, was shared with a, a political com campaigning uh, company that mm. then used targeted advertising to influence voting behavior, right? But that's what we do with political advertisement all the time, right? Right. Um, I think it was the scale of things, um, on uh, the scale on which things happened. Um, also, you very clearly saw a breach of trust between two companies, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Uh, and that goes back to one of the standard principles in data protection is purpose limitation, which means that um, even if you have given your consent to um, a, a collection of data to a company, that company can only use the data for the purpose that you've given your consent for. It cannot use it for a different purpose unless that purpose is compatible with the first purpose. Sounds 
like legal terminology, and it is, but in practice it means that um, Cambridge Analytica had the consent of a lot of people who made certain um, psychological tests um, um, through a link via Facebook. It could use that information, but it used it for other purposes. And that was a purpose that people did not consent to. And that's also where the breach of trust was between Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Yeah. It, uh, it also goes back to the difference between privacy and data protection, but we might come, that, come yeah, to but that later. Do we ever really consent to the purpose of, of what the data is used for? Because uh, as, as we've said mm -hmm. time and time again, we don't really read the terms and yeah. conditions. So I, the I've box. consented to, I don't, I yeah. don't even know what I've consented yeah. to in my life. Yeah. So, so then why is this specific lack of consent so deciding and, and, and so, so horrible? Why should we worry about it? We should worry about it because it can be used against us. It can actually be used to, and then we go back to the judging, to um, make decisions that affect us negatively. And that is the consequences, that is the judgment uh, that we are just talking about. Yeah. Mm, <coughs> but isn't something like that Cambridge Analytica did uh, very similar to basically just uh, political targeted advertising? And targeted advertising is something that's basically done already with posters hung up in, in schools like in, in, in universities and billboards along certain highways that's known that mm -hmm. people with, uh, with a certain background drive by. What makes things like targeted advertising and Cambridge Analytica so much worse than simply targeting people on the street? I think targeted advertising is, is fantastic. <laughs> I think that everybody should um, uh, advertise me targeted, so know who I am, what I do, what I like, what I don't like. I don't want to see anything about cats or dogs. <laughs> I don't have that. So why show me? So give me target advertisement, but I want to be in control. I want to have consented to it, and I want to know that you don't sell it or uh, resell it and make money out of it. And what do I get back for it? So I get target advertisement, but you might also want to give another trade-off to me. Um, like an extra percentage of discount or whatever. So I think that target advertising is better than um, just the, the basis of assumptions. However, you should execute it well. And that's often not the case. So the problem here is the consent that people give when advertising targetly. A transparent, informed consent that you know what will happen and also know what the impact and, I and the consequences will be of it. So and that you know it. Sorry, there, there's another issue with it. Um, if you have, I, I agree, targeted advertising for a company, it's a gold mine. Um, if, if, if they can base targeted advertising on, on a complete data set. Um, from the point of view of a consumer, you will see only these targeted ads. Yeah. You, you will see only what the company has chosen to give you, to give you and for you to see. That means that you do not see the whole picture. That means that your freedom of choice is somewhere cut because you only see what that company has decided to, to, to let you see. Yeah, so our freedom of choice is basically limited. Yeah. It doesn't, li like I said before, it doesn't always happen with, with advertising in general because it, it, uh, the, the MPO gives mm -hmm. very different advertisements than the SBS. Which but that's mass advertising. If you talk about billboards along the highway, that's for everybody the same. If you log into your computer, if you log into the internet and you surf to the website of, of a newspaper, the banners that you will see on the corner of your screen will be targeted at you, yeah. will be personalized for you. Yeah, so there's, there's as what you say is there's also a limitation of, of autonomy, of freedom of choice, and mm -hmm. all of these principles to some w in some way relate to, to privacy matters online. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. If you talk about news, yes, because you're being kept blind for mm -hmm. certain topics. If you talk about uh, certain shopping behavior, so if you are a retailer um, and you sell stuff, then I'm pretty fine seeing stuff which is not interested for me because I don't have the cats, the dog, the kids, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, so, but it's a good point because news, I don't want to be kept blind for certain topics. So please feed me those. Um, uh, so I think it's, it, it depends on which yep. industry you're It talking. can be very yeah. convenient yeah. to yeah. indeed see only the products that you like. Yeah. Yeah. For example, on Netflix, when they recommend a series, then yeah. it's, it's useful because it yeah. can give you a lot of hours yeah. of uh, But what about changing happiness. your mind? If yeah, yeah. at a certain <laughs> way you do want to have a cat or a dog, yeah. <laughs> the company doesn't necessarily know that. Yeah, but sh should you now have, supposedly, 
put people back in control and mm -hmm. have like a kind of dashboard where you can switch your uh, preferences. So where you can be... Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, <laughs> something where you can show online, okay, I now have a cat. I hated it before, but I now found a nice one. Um, so give me ads you about the cat. You can just Google cats a few times, right? And then Google and them. Then no. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your profile will change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Madame you you've mentioned the, the difference between data protection and privacy. Um, what is the difference? Well, I realize that um, um, this might sound very academic, but... Um, I like the fact that you started with the definition of privacy from the dictionary. I didn't even know that that was exactly the definition of privacy in the dictionary. Because in general, there is no definition of privacy. And that's a good thing, because privacy changes. Privacy uh, is different depending on location, is different depending on time. Um, many, many years ago, and I'm talking now about centuries ago, you would have uh, 12 people living in, in a two-bedroom apartment, where you now have two people living in a 12-bedroom apartment. So. Privacy has changed a lot and is dependent on time and location. Um, so the definition you found in the dictionary is actually a very academic definition, the right to be let alone. That was um, um, developed by two academics um, in the US in, in 1890, so it's already very old, but it's still valid today. It stands at the, at the test of time. The right to be let alone is a very good description. It means none of your business. I have the right to be let alone. I have the right to say this is none of your business. Data protection, on the other hand, um, protects personal data. And personal data are these data that identify you as an individual, that allow you to be isolated from a group of people. Now, to a certain extent, that overlaps with privacy, but not completely. In privacy, for example, your sexual preference would be falling under your privacy, but does not necessarily identify you as an individual. Um, it's important that difference, uh, that distinction, because in the EU, we now have both rights. Since 2009, we have a right to privacy, but we also have a fundamental right to data protection, and that's new. Well, since 2009, uh, so it's nine years old. A lot of people don't know that, that we have a separate right to data protection, separate from privacy. Why is that useful to have that? Cambridge Analytica Facebook is another good example in this context, because I think as a consumer, if you are affected by Cambridge Analytica Facebook, you would have a hard time arguing this based on the right to privacy, but I think you would have a much easier time arguing this based on the right to data protection because it concerned personal data. And that's where the difference really becomes relevant. Yeah, so the, so the difference is that, that uh, uh, data protection is about random elements of information that ties back to me individually. Exactly. And the right to privacy is things that I don't want to share with other people. Like exactly. that's that's different. Yeah. So it's it's a it's it empowers people to legally challenge companies or other in, uh, institutions uh, um, uh, when they limit that. That's, Data that's protection. The goal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's go to the definition of privacy, the right to be left alone mm -hmm. or let alone actually. Uh, in this globalized and 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 um, and, and giant society that we live in now, and the digitalized society even, is the right to be let alone still that important? Because I personally wouldn't mind a random computer in China having my information. Miss Sponsor. That's quite the statement. <laughs> 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 um, I would mind, because they, they, they have no right whatsoever to know those kind of things about me. I, I like to have a certain things that nobody knows, because they're mine, so there are things I don't want to share. I want to be myself um, um, one day and determine to be somebody else the other day. So I, I want to be have the freedom to, to determine without assumptions, without judgment, uh, and to do the things I like. So it's it's I think saying put everything open and you're fine with China um, looking into your personal stuff. I think that's quite the statement. So would you say the gathering of data is as much a problem as what is done with the data? Uh, yeah. Yes. Can I, can I just add to that? I think the right to privacy is still very important because it allows us to exercise other rights. A right to freedom, or rights or freedoms, I should say. The freedom of speech being one of the more important ones. So I think it allows us to live a more free life. I think it allows us, it, it, it actually is respect. Privacy is respect for the life as a human being. So would you then also say that the gathering of data in itself is a problem and not necessarily what's done with the data? Oh, everything, I think. One leads to yeah. the other. Yeah. So everything is... So if you uh, gather it, collect it, transfer it, share it, use it, everything you do with personal data, 
um, uh, is related to it. Mm. All right, um, let's go to the audience and see if there are any uh, questions here. See here in the front. Hello. Um, I want to go back to your uh, worst nightmare scenario that was mentioned earlier, and I got the impression that you believe that giving people back more control on, of their privacy on what is shared will help to prevent that. Now, I personally think it's a really, really small step from the profiling and the targeted advertising we currently have to doing uh, uh, things which are very close to the, to the nightmare scenario, which is individual risk management in healthcare, in in almost anything, in uh, for example, selecting uh, on based on um, on a machine learning algorithm who is most successful to finish a study at uh, the UVA here, right? And you can do that all based on the profiles of people. Now, I personally believe that we should do much more on the legislation side to prevent such things. So, simply do not allow, for example, good drivers to have a discount. Uh, I, it, it won't be the Gal and Gal or the Albert Heijn uh, drinking the bottle, my bottles of wine, but I, I can do a lot of um, predicting uh, on all those risks based on stuff that you will share for different purposes. Yeah, so, so running, profiling for example, based yeah. on, on big data. Yeah, so, I, yeah. I, so, so how, how well does my GDPR prevent against those developments? Uh, it will in the future. Um, so the GDPR limits, as, as well as the, the current um, directive, um, prohibits certain activities around uh, analytics, uh, but it also allows opportunities, provided that they're executed well. So based on the right conditions that you have, um, uh, just the right interest consent, that you have this ground for processing, that you have a purpose for processing. So it will be determined very clearly in the GDPR, um, is it allowed? what you do, but it will limit uh, profiling to a certain extent. On the other hand, and that's probably something yeah, you want to jump into, um, with pseudonymized data, um, more will be possible under the GDPR. Um, so if your data is being pseudonymized, I hate that word, <laughs> um, then there are more opportunities, um, perhaps also for profiling. Is there another question? Uh, I see there in the back, there's someone with a question. Um, good afternoon. My question is of the category agree, disagree, or comment on the statement. Uh, so would you, wouldn't you say that this um, loss of privacy, even if gradual, marks and symbolizes a sort of transition uh, in which people regret or give up some traditional values? I'm sorry, I know it's a little philosophical just to hear what you'd comment on that. Madame de Besser? That's a very difficult question. Um, do you mean that people would give up other values also for convenience? Yeah, yeah, I mean some, uh, uh, I mean some unconscious choice for additional benefits such as convenience of usage or similar. This reminds me actually of a, of a few statements that were in the press with regard to Facebook also, whether users of Facebook could in future be asked to pay for Facebook if they do not give their data to Facebook. It's an interesting thing to, th to think of because then you would really see clearly the trade-off between convenience and giving up your data. I don't have a black and white answer to your question because it's something to really reflect on. Uh, and, and thank you for uh, putting the buzz in our, in our heads because this is, this is quite a, a good discussion to have. Um, but whether it reflects on giving up other values, um, I'm not so sure. I think somebody will probably be doing a PhD research on it <laughs> because this is, this is quite a good uh, and deep discussion to, to have. Good ideas, good ideas. Is there uh, another question from the audience? Uh, here in the front. Thank you for coming. Uh, uh, we recently saw in the media that uh, Facebook might be moving their data sets to the US in order, I saw, to uh, escape the GDPR regulation. 
this was actually then uh, followed up by some of the, big of the biggest newspapers. So I was wondering whether that is really uh, maybe some of the concerns that Facebook is having, or are they actually uh, trying to adjust to the new regulation? What are we seeing? Madam, who is there anyone you are addressing this? I think Ms. Ponsley, you're the GDPR expert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I, saw I also saw that notice, and I thought, okay, if you move, then you would want to do that because you think that you will not fall uh, under the scope of the GDPR. The GDPR is a European um, uh, regulation. But the thing is that I think that they will remain falling in the scope of the GDPR because they will also focus on European markets. So the only thing they could do to escape that if they would do it in the US and only focus on, for example, US um, uh, citizens mm -hmm. and, uh, and US uh, customers. Um, at the end of the day, this is a discussion coming more and more that, um, and I think we will talk about the GDPR later on, but the GDPR has this fine of 4% of the worldwide turnover, saying that if you don't comply to, to the rules, then you need to pay a fine of the worldwide turnover. So a lot of organizations are now trying to um, create certain escapes based on their governance, based on their um, the, 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 the country where they reside. Um, to escape possible fines. Um, so I think that might be the case that they, um, uh, that Facebook wanted to ex escape that one, uh, but I don't think that they will. Yeah. All right, yeah. thank you very much for the question. Uh, we've already been talking about GDPR, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation Law, right now. Uh, Ms. Ponsolet, what kind of companies are most, uh, most affected by the new law? Um, most? Uh, in any event, I think every company will be affected. Um, the GDPR, as said, is a, is a regulation which has been, uh, I think the first leaked version was in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, now in May 25th, it will be in full effect. Everybody had mm -hmm. two years of implementation um, to make sure that they comply, that the organization complies. Uh, the scope is, in principle, Europe, but also organizations uh, that are outside um, of Europe that focus on European market. Mm -hmm. So the scope is huge. It could also be a US company focusing on European markets, um, which, at the end of the day, is all about personal data. So it's about the data of citizens, about patients, about um, uh, customers. So it's for, for the l if you look at industries, for FSI, for the financial industry, for banks, it will be important. It will be imp important for in the life science and health tech mm -hmm. because it's also sensitive data. You have personal data, you have more sensitive personal data, like the medical, like the criminal, uh, et cetera. So at the end of the day, every organization needs to comply it, whether it's big or small. Mm -hmm. Um, so the ones that will be uh, impacted, uh, um, the, the, the smallest, I think, will be the ones that only have three employees, do not process any personal data of customers, uh, and only those three employees, and are focused in Sutomir. <laughs> <Sorry. Sutomir>. <laughs> Very <laughs> specific. Oh, <laughs> oh, random places Very I can't specific. call out. But yeah. So at the end of the day, it will be, you have also organizations which have a huge international um, employee um, uh, base, so yeah, it will be uh, impacted. Um, it will impact everybody. All right. Uh, and can you maybe explain very shortly uh, what concrete changes companies will have to make in order to comply with the GDPR law? Um, let us um, underline that we already had this directive, uh, and it might come as a huge surprise to a lot of organizations, but there were already rules which you need to comply to. And I think if you were 100% compliant to those, then the changes weren't as big now. However, most of the companies have not complied to these either, so now everything comes as a big surprise. Um, biggest changes are, in certain cases, you need the data protection officer, uh, you have now the accountability, so you need to show that you comply. Um, data subjects get more rights, so you have the right to access your data, the right to delete your data, uh, the right to data portability, so to process your, your personal data from one to the other. Uh, there's a data breach notification included, so if there's a data breach, you need to notify to the authorities, in certain cases to the individuals. Um, so at the end of the day, the GDPR is about giving the white lines of the soccer field in which you need to play, and you cannot cross those lines. Mm -hmm. um, you can determine as an organization how you can play the rest of your game, but you should be aware of the white lines you need to play in. Um, let's first have a, have a quick look on the consumer side of things. 
uh, the GPR seems to mainly add a lot more boxes to tick with, uh, um, uh, with uh, you've read the terms and conditions and you agree with them. Uh, how does this solve anything now that we've looked at actually nobody reads those terms and conditions? Um, I think what the GDPR will bring with it is when you use a service of a company or when you, when you shop online, for example, you give consent <coughs> to the use of your personal data, but you will have to take a lot more boxes because the consent has to be very specific mm -hmm. and has to um, not just have you agree with all of it, but needs to have an active confirmation of your agreement. Um, that will make companies think of what data they collect in every contact with you, and it will have to. It, it will make companies think of how they're using that and how they obtain your consent in the right way to comply with the GDPR. So it's mainly to to make companies aware of what specific information they gather, mm -hmm. rather than really creating more awareness with yeah. the uh, with the public, with the consumers. Well. Awareness will be, I think, the consequence of it. Because if you have to ha tick several boxes, you will hopefully... <laughs> I think I won't, actually, but that might just be me. <laughs> <laughs> read what it says there and be very specific in your agreement. Yeah. And so I hope that, it, to go back to the example that I gave a few minutes ago, downloading an app that will give um, the choice either between downloading um, and giving access to your data or not downloading will now specify, I want to download the app of, let's say, the Dutch railway system, but I do not want to give the app uh, access to my photos on my smartphone. That, I think, will be the, the new practice. Yeah, yeah and I think, if I can jump into that, uh, the organizations that deal with this GDPR in a smart way are also able to see the upside of things. So. Um, become more intimate with their customers, use the personal data mm -hmm. uh, in a rightful way, but also being like in a trustful relationship with the customer are the ones to survive. Right. If they have a really clear, but short, transparent message, privacy statement, and they ask a good, focused consent for things, and you think, oh, I like this, and they even give me no. 10 uh, euros of discount, I like this organization. Yeah. I feel comfortable. I also have the feeling that they will treat it well. And that's a selling point again that you yeah. referred to in the beginning yeah. as well. That yeah, it and becomes I mean, yeah. an extra benefit of a company. Yeah, yeah. And, and it becomes an ethical topic. At the end of the day, it's about the use of personal data, the process of personal data, and the GDPR is one of the things you need to take into account. But every organization needs to assess the ethical point which it has around using personal data. Where do we want to go? Yeah. Another element of the of the law that we would like to discuss is the fact that as a consumer you can request all the data that a company has on you. Um, we've we've noticed that a lot of companies are uh, are very worried about that because that in in theory could mean that they would be busy all day long just gathering a lot of data and sending it out uh, to people. Uh, Madam Sponsor, do you hear the, that worry a lot as well in your job? Um, every day. <laughs> yeah. um, and they are, they should be worried. And the reason why is because they have no clue what the d where the data is. So yeah. the organizations do not know where the data is, who has access, which systems it's in, um, uh, where did it, how long it has been there, on which grounds, etc. So their landscape, their data landscape is, is totally unclear, totally scattered, has been there for years, so they don't have insight. That's also the reason why the GDPR says you need to have um, like an inventory or an, a data flow analysis about where your data is. If you have that clear, if you know where your data is, if you have your systems around it, then it should be a button on the, uh, just a, uh, on the a click on the button to have the data and to send it. So it's not the, the request that worries them, it's the, the fact that they don't know where to get the right data um, yeah. and also in, in time. Yeah. How, how is it possible that the data is so tangled right now? Because at least to me, it, it, it would seem kind of intuitive that companies would know what data they gather and where, but is it just like one massive server that ev stores it's everything? Or it's a storage. So um, what, what companies often do is they build these um, big storage rooms that are filled with a big number of servers. Usually they like building this in the colder regions of the world because it generates a lot of heat. So to air, conditioning, mm -hmm. uh, to air condition that room, that costs a lot of money. So if you build it in a colder region, that, that helps. Um, but that might often be outside of the jurisdiction of where the head, of, uh, the, the head seat of the main seat or, uh, of the company is. 
Um, what Google has said in one of the previous cases in the US, which was around, w was evolving around the question of data location, Google said we um, cut up the data in chunks and we save them on different data centers that are placed over the US and over the world. That means in practice that um, an email with an attachment, the body of the email could be sitting on a server in Europe and the attachment could be sitting on a server in the US. And then Google made another statement in that same case that I thought was quite interesting. They said, we, to ensure security of the systems, uh, for example, if a fire breaks out, and to ensure the performance of these systems, of these big server rooms, um, they automatically make the data jump from one server to the other. And Google made that statement to um, demonstrate that the time where, let's say, in a police investigation, police or prosecution requests data from Google, at the time that the request is made, the data may be sitting on a different server than at the time that the request is executed. Yeah. And that just makes it so much more difficult. But that's also very, um, a, a very good point because GDPR is a European law. Mm -hmm. How does that affect then the, the, the multinationality of, of data streams of big companies like, like Google and, uh, uh, and, and Facebook? But the GDPR is addressed to, well, I should, shouldn't say addressed, it's directed to the individual. Mm -hmm. So the citizen um, who is addressed by a company, like you said, citizens in the EU who are customers of an American company, such as the Googles and the Facebooks and, and the YouTubes of today, regardless of whether that is a service that is paid for, that company will have to comply with a GDPR. Yeah. yeah. Which will, I think, trigger kind of an export effect of EU data protection principles, because how it is will. Facebook going to make a distinction between the data on EU, um, uh, the data of people who fall under the scope of the GDPR, and those who do not. Yeah. So it would be a lot easier for them to just make all their systems compliant with GDPR. And so that's, of course, also the reason why more companies are now going to BCRs, binding corporate mm -hmm. rules. Um, that's um, a method to legalize your transfers. Right. Uh, it's like your code of conduct for your organization. And uh, the bigger multinationals already did that in the past. But GDPR will trigger that because it will harmonize your international data landscape. Or not harmonize it, but the way how you transfer, you your how you legalize your, um, your data transfers. Yeah. Uh, if you look at what Google does to secure their data, so make data jump from server to server to make it more secure, would streamlining data not make it less secure then because it would stay on one server possibly? Well, putting all the data on one server, that would indeed be risky in security terms, because what if something happens to that server? What if it, it is broken into? Uh, what if simply a fire or a storm happens and that, that server um, um, malfunctions? I think I can understand Google that they do this from a security point of view and from a performance of their systems mm -hmm. point of view. Um, but it would make it more difficult for them to know exactly where the data are and under which jurisdiction they are. And it's a jurisdictional question, actually. It's a jurisdictional problem. Mm -hmm. So maybe th this is then the law that has a lot of impact on, on many companies. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of panic, we've heard, uh, for companies as well. Um, to what extent can we expect that this is actually going to be enforced, that the government's really going to monitor every company, really fining them? Madam Sponsley, what do you think? Um, I think so. The, the 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 entry date will be May 25th. I don't expect them to be there on uh, the 26th. That's also Saturday. But um, I don't see that happening. I do know that um, the regulators w with whom we talk they are rapidly expanding. So I think that the Dutch authority, Autoriteit uh, Persoonsgegevens, um, was I think around 100 people. They will be three times as big the coming year. Uh, same goes for the CNIL in France, same goes for the ECO in, in the UK. So they're all like um, focusing on having more people in. And yes, they will enforce, uh, they will check, they will investigate, uh, and it will not be the toothless tiger that the directive was, because um, uh, it has been such an important topic now. Um, and I think that there's also a reason why they really increased the fines, so that we as a society, um, um, have more have more freedom. Right, you've said that um, data regulation laws already existed, but companies barely comply to them. Um, do you think companies can also work around or not comply to the GDPR in, in a similar manner? 
and companies will work around it in a way that they've already done with the data regulation laws uh, right now? Or do you think that's less easy in this case? Less likely, maybe even? I think it will be less likely. Of course, the question will always remain, like, are you being investigated by an authority? On the other hand, you always have, I if, if you have a data breach, and it's made public, then you also have an issue there because it's open. And subsequently, also the customers, the patients, the citizens have the opportunity to complain about what happens with their data. And now more awareness is, is, is there in the topic or for the topic. I think it will be, um, uh, yeah. So would you say the GDPR is m also more of a deterrent that maybe one company is majorly fined and then other companies think, well, I would not like that, so uh, I'll comply to GDPR as well. I hope at the end of the day, but that's a wish that companies will not only comply because they have to comply, mm -hmm. but because they think it's important to comply. Mm -hmm. And that's also what that to my client, it, it's it's not only a, um, a legislative topic, it's an ethical topic about how you want to deal with this. It's like sustainability. So you need to determine, especially when you're shifting business models, um, where you are going to make more use of data than you did before, then it's something to take into account. Um, and that's a willingness to comply with the GDPR. But then privacy should also become a more central value in society, right? More than it is now, because like we said before, we, we value convenience over privacy often. Mm -hmm. And in order for companies to care more about privacy, then as a society, we should also value privacy more than our convenience. Yep. Do you see that happening anytime soon, Miss uh, Debusser? It's not going to happen overnight. It's, it's, it's a gradual process. And um, the GDPR has created an enormous buzz, mostly with companies. But I've gradually started to see that even citizens have heard the acronym GDPR, yeah. want to know what it is, want to know what their rights are under GDPR. And th it's, um, we have to be careful that we're putting the right narrative out there because there's also a lot of stories about what rights you have under the GDPR. I think it's, it's um, important to be correct and, and to be accurate um, um, and to be informative towards citizens. But it is a topic that it's alive. And I think 20 years ago, privacy and data protection were not that much talked about. But it was also a different. Like this. It was also different. Because you were had you because didn't we didn't all have a smartphone yeah. and, 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 and we didn't do that much online. So times have changed and gradually people are waking up to it. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, to conclude the interview, um, we've been talking about privacy for about an hour now. Mm. And um, uh, I would like to, uh, yeah, to have a statement. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Mark Zuckerberg said that privacy is dead, get over it. <laughs> and um, he actually came back upon that, uh, upon that statement uh, a week, about a week ago <laughs> when he was investigated for privacy <laughs> breach himself. Uh, but imagine he's watching the live stream right now. How would you respond to that statement, Ms. DeBusser? I would say privacy is respect. Full stop. And right. not dead. It's not dead, it's not, not at all. Dead. No. And we should no. not get over it. <laughs> and we should certainly <laughs> not get over it. Like I said, we're waking up to it and that's a good ev evolution. Yeah. And Ms. Ponsele? Um, I think everybody should be, um, uh, should want to be in control of their own life and their own personal data. And I think you have that ground right, that fundamental right, um, and it has been given to you, so I think you should use it. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. And on that uh, note and encouragement, um, I would like to um, first let you guys know that we're back on the 3rd of May on SAFA Investment Day uh, for an interview on common ownership and institutional investors. It's going to be great fun, so we hope to see you all there. Uh, and for now, thank you very much to Madame de Busser, uh, Madame de Busser and Madame Sponsolet. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thanks.